Hardy's The Woodlanders was first published in 1887. It tells the story of a group of woodlanders whose self-contained lives are disordered by non-native outsiders, Dr Fitzpiers, Mrs Sharmans, and their own naive ignorance. The reader's view of George Melbury is likely to vary dramatically depending on his or her own time and context. At the time of the first publication, many would have viewed him as a well-meaning, devoted father with his daughter's best interests at heart. However, modern readers are more likely to view him as an overbearing meddler who repeatedly and patronisingly treats his daughter as his own personal object and fails to consider that she may have a mind of her own. Melbury's devotion to his daughter is seen very early on in the novel. In chapter three, he is unable to sleep and his wife and Grace's stepmother questions him, why worry about her always? The adverb always indicates the haunting extent to which Melbury frets about his beloved daughter. It is something he cannot stop thinking about. Indeed, considering the social and historical context of the time, he has good reasons to worry. Second, I have not invested any money specially for her to put her out of the reach of poverty if my affairs fail. Opportunities for respectable women to work and earn money were severely limited during this period. Just 7% of middle class women um, were employed, either as business owners or dreaded governesses, with a sprinkling involved in writing or the arts. Additionally, agricultural wages in Wessex or Dorset would have been particularly low, with Patricia Ingham describing them as the lowest agricultural wages in England. Living within this perilous economic climate, in which most women had to depend financially on men purely to survive, there is no wonder that Melbury hesitates when it comes to sanctioning a relationship between Grace and an ordinary member of the local agricultural workforce, Giles Winterbourne. And in hesitating, he is thinking responsibly and lovingly. However, modern readers, especially those of a feminist bent, are likely to take issue with the language used by Melbury to describe his daughter. In the same chapter previously referenced, he confides his feelings anxiously to his wife. But since I've educated her so well and so long and so far above the level of the daughters hereabouts, it is wasting her to give her to a man of no higher standing than he. By positioning himself as the subject within the initial subordinate clause, since I have educated her so well, Melbury is indirectly emphasising his daughter's position as the object, the person to be acted upon, whether that is to be educated or married. The concept of his daughter thinking or acting as the subject or independently is clearly alien to him, and, is the, and it is the assumption of female passivity which can unsettle the modern reader. Indeed, the use of the verb give in the phrase, give her to a man to be married, has connotations of transactional benevolence. It is though the woman is an entirely passive gift to be bestowed from one man to another. Yet, once again, it is vital to analyse characters and texts within their context. To return to Patricia Ingham's excellent contextual work, she suggests that women at home were often seen as children in need of care and control by those with stronger intellects and better judgment. This fits exactly with Melbury's view of his daughter. He most certainly sees her as needing his male care, control and better judgment. When later events in the novel suggest that actually his judgment was poor and caused and will continue to cause his daughter a great deal of suffering, he is left a confused and bewildered figure. Hardy is indicating that blind belief in social constructs such as the superiority of men and the upper classes can be destructive and this is something I will explore in more detail later on within this video. 
For there is no question that Melbury's meddling and preening belief in his own superior male judgment directly result in Grace living an anxious, unsettled, largely unfulfilled existence. Her marriage to the flighty, unreliable Edward Fitzpierce may provide her with flushes of anticipatory sexual excitement, but it was never going to provide stability and contentment. Grace's unhappiness is hinted at strongly during her exchange with her father in chapter 35, following the latter's ill-fated assistance of a dazed and unwittingly discreet Fitzpierce. In a rare attack on her father, she cries suddenly, he is my husband, and now you have married me to him. Surely you need not provoke him unnecessarily. First, you induce me to accept him, and then you do things that divide us more than we should naturally be divided. Resentment drips from Grace's language, both in the continuing adoption of the male as subject, female as object structure, which places the responsibility for her unhappy marriage firmly on her father's shoulders and also in the use of the verb induce, which emphasises that some persistent persuasion was required to get her to agree to the marriage. Writing in The Spectator in 1887, R.H. Hutton also charges Melbury with full responsibility for his daughter's misery. He writes, Grace's father, who makes so terrible a mess of his own and his daughter's life, chiefly through the overweening idolatry with which he regards her. By this analysis, Melbury is motivated by a kind of hero worship for his daughter, making him desperate and blinded in his quest to do everything possible to make her life happy. Whilst there is some truth in this, I feel Melbury's unwitting blunders are more to do with his obsequious reverence for the class system as well as his inability to act rationally with those from outside the confines of Little Hinton. Following Fitzpiers's somewhat impulsive, hesitant declaration to Melbury about his feelings for Grace, the simple old timber merchant responds, it would be deceit if I were to pretend to feel anything else than highly honoured by your wish. And it is a great credit to her to have drawn to her a man of such good professional station and venerable old family. That huntsman fellow little thought how wrong he was about her. Take her and welcome, sir. Both later events and insights from the narrator into Fitzpiers's wavering, self-indulgent mind suggest that Melbury's awed deference for Fitzpiers's higher class, as indicated by gushing phrases such as highly honoured and great credit, may be unhelpfully colouring his judgment. His snappy imperatives, take her and welcome, within an extremely short concluding sentence, are rash and imply unquestioning reverence for Fitzpiers without any thought given to how an old family man can practically benefit his daughter or whether the doctor's professional station is quite as good as he is suggesting. Furthermore, the aside about that huntsman fellow, which Fitzpiers cannot possibly understand, indicates that past historical events, arguably trivial, albeit mildly humiliating ones, are propelling him towards hasty, potentially harmful decision-making. But it is not just when dealing with Fitzpiers' courtship of his daughter that Melbury's judgment is impaired. He is also fatally carried away by his ignorance and hope when he places his faith in Bocock. Keen to make amends for his, with hindsight, destructive support for Fitzpiers' pursuit of his daughter, the narrator makes it clear straight away that his trust in the ability of the former legal clerk to obtain a divorce is foolish and naive. Speaking excitedly to Giles, who quite rightly entertains fearful doubts about the likelihood of a divorce, he ludicrously describes Bocock as a thorough lawyer, nothing the matter with him but a fiery palate. Meanwhile, the narrator has previously painted a different picture referring to this apparently thorough lawyer having fallen into the mire, lost his post, and after an absence spent in trying his powers elsewhere, came back to his native town where, 
At the time of the foregoing events in Hintock, he gave legal advice for astonishingly small fees, mostly carrying on his profession in public house settles. The overall impression of Bocock is of a drunk chancer, albeit one with a quick mind. Melbury's miscalculation about Bocock causes yet more misery for his daughter and Giles, as he recklessly urges them to start preparing for the former's freedom and a new relationship together. When he finally finds out that his faith in Bocock and the benign fairness of the legal system was misplaced, he is left to roar wearily at the two childhood sweethearts that, after all, they will not be able to be together I don't blame you, I don't blame you, he said, in the weary cadence of one broken down with scourgings. But you too must walk together no more. I have been surprised. I have been cruelly deceived. Giles, don't say anything to me, but go away. Melbury's language has literally decomposed. From the early affluent formality of gushing acquiescence towards Fitzpiers, his phrasing is now broken and fragmented. He can only utter brief phrases about his own feelings and once again note how he positions himself as the subject and in doing so implicitly fails to appreciate that the burden of suffering must lie with his daughter more than himself before switching abruptly to order Giles away. The, the narrator's use of the noun scourgings is revealing and indeed Melbury himself uses the past participle form of this word towards the end of the novel, when he believes that his daughter indulged in sexual shenanigans with Giles just before his woodland death. A scourge can be defined as a source of persistent trouble, such as pestilence that causes pain and suffering or widespread destruction. Within this context, it suggests both intense suffering and that Melbury's previously held values and beliefs have been severely jolted. He previously believed blindly in the institution of marriage and that marrying someone from a higher class could only be a positive thing. He is no longer so sure and at the end of the novel cuts a somewhat bewildered, lost figure, confused by his daughter's inevitable decision to resurrect her wretched relationship with Fitzpiers. Towards the beginning of this video, I suggested that Melbury's meddling causes his daughter to have a miserable life. However, an alternative argument might suggest that love and happiness are invariably thwarted within the landscape of the woodlanders. Marty South loves Giles unrequitedly and is left a desperately lonely figure at the end of the novel, impotently aiming loving words at his grave. Felice Sharman loves Fitzpiers, yet knows that any happiness they obtain is likely to be guilt-stained and short-lived. Suki Damson also loves Fitzpiers and has to be dragged away reluctantly to New Zealand by a desperate, jealous husband. Even the stolidly married Melburys married for desperately prosaic reasons. Within this broader landscape of regularly thwarted love, Perhaps it is unfair to blame Melbury too much for propelling Grace so forcefully towards Fitzpiers and a life of frustrated lack of fulfilment. Because in the melancholy world of the Woodlanders, idyllic wedded love seems unattainable anyway, for reasons including the problematic nature of sexual desire having to be channeled through the institution of marriage, the fact that many of us yearn after things we cannot have because we cannot have them, and that however natural or passionate our feelings for someone, we cannot guarantee that these will be reciprocated. Under this argument, even if Melbury had not meddled, some other obstacle or hurdle would have arisen to frustrate his daughter's future happiness. To conclude, George Melbury in The Woodlanders is both a devoted father Yet someone who unwittingly causes his daughter a great deal of misery due to his slathering, rigid, unquestioning subservience to societal rules such as the desirability of social advancement and the institution of marriage. His incessant meddling in his daughter's life is ultimately destructive but needs to be viewed through the lens of a context in which women were genuinely seen as inferior to men 
and in need of expert guidance. In many ways, Melbury's failure can be ascribed to the fact he doesn't realise the world he inhabits is complicated. Writing in The Great Web, the form of Hardy's fiction, Ian Gregor suggests that the world in which Melbury has lived has a complexity about it which Henchard's never had. Not just a complexity of institutions, but a complexity of character shaped by those institutions, with which the self-made man, the man of simple vows to the past and judgment about the future, is ill-equipped to deal. To expand further, so many human possibilities fail to occur to Melbury, including the idea that a man, especially one from supposedly a higher class, could be unfaithful to his wife or that someone from a higher class could be morally inferior to those from his own level. He is well-meaning, but lost within an indifferent world in which the outdated institutions of deference to class and marriage cause unnecessary pain and suffering. This has been a Schofield on Shakespeare production exploring the presentation of Melbury in The Woodlanders. Many thanks for watching.